everyone to Women in Criminal Law Race Policy Committee's first ever in conversation with uh, members of the judiciary. And we are really, really excited and also very, very privileged to have three um, female judges with us who are really going to take us through, hopefully, their career path, the journey to the bench and give us an insight into what life is like um, on the bench. And so I'm Laurie Ann Power. I'm the chair of the Race Equality Committee. I'm a barrister at 25 Bedford Row. Um, I deal with criminal defence work of, of, of all different kinds. And I will pass you over to my co-host, Farah Arshad. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Farah Arshad. I'm at Doughty Street Chambers. I also practice in crime. Uh, I, I do also uh, practice in appellate work specifically. Um, and I'm very excited to be here. So what, what we were hoping to do um, is to ask each of you a little bit uh, about your uh, journeys. Um, I'm going to take it in turn, if I may, and I hope I don't offend anyone by saying we're going to do it in uh, order of seniority. Uh, and Judge Mensah, that means I'm coming to you first. Um, you've been a circuit judge, I believe, now since 2005. And um, from my uh, research, uh, I discovered that you were born in Ghana, but sent to the UK to be educated. And I think, is it right that you, you were here since you were six years old and educated in, in England? Yes, that's right. Uh, and initially you did a philosophy degree, but then the law called you and you did a conversion. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Um, I went to university to do an engineering degree. And after a few months, I didn't like that. So I changed to psychology. And after a few months, I didn't like that either. And I saw that there was a group of students who were having more fun than me. And they were doing philosophy. And so I changed to philosophy. And at the end of philosophy, having wasted four years faffing around with different subjects, I then had to think about um, a career. So it's not something that ever came to my mind early. A tutor said to me, why not do law? And I what was your um, practice area when, when you were a barrister? I started off in a general common law set at um, One Grayson Square, which was um, uh, Markham Weitzman when I was there. Then it became Carl Tepper and it became something else. So it was general common law. I did criminal pupillage with uh, Hollis Weitzman and also criminal with um, what was Victor Durand set. It's now three Raymond buildings. And um, then general common law. I did quite a lot of teaching, which I enjoyed tremendously because it was at the time in, I suppose, the late 80s when the bar school was having problems with discrimination allegations by students against tutors. And so a lot of them were, had their time taken up before the Board of Visitors. And so they were looking for practitioners who would do some part time teaching. Uh, and so I did some part time teaching for about two or three years. And then I got into immigration and I did a lot of immigration. And um, then I applied for judicial post and um, moved back into crime. Uh, tell us, first of all, what was your first, was your degree a law degree or did you yes, also do yes. something else then? No, I was three years old. I saw a wig on television. I told my mother I wanted it. She said, then you have to be a barrister. I said, I'll be a barrister. She said, you have to be honourable. I said, I am honourable. <laughs> so that was it, really. So at nine, I'd already chosen the LSE. I'd chosen my options. I even knew what I was going to do at the end of court school of law. And I dismissed my teacher who told me I had to come in and do some history because I said, no, I'm busy. I'm choosing my options. <laughs> Nine was a great moment to tell her that she never really got over it. That was it. I was on a mission. I was always on a mission and I remain on a mission. Um, so I knew it was going to be difficult. I kept being told by teachers and everybody else that, you know, I wasn't welcome, etc. And when I joined Middle Temple, I was only 19, I think, or 20 because that was the LSE. And we started dining, we being my best friend, Julian Lambert, who is a judge at Bristol. And we started dining together, but Middle Temple were as unfriendly as and difficult as they could be to me. They wouldn't book my dinners, so he had to go and book my dinners for me. There were never spaces available. And when it came to being called, we need a, a venture to sign our certificates. So his was provided and I was told, well, I don't know if you'll be able to be called this time, Ms. Paul, because we don't have anyone who's willing to sign your certificate. But then the younger girl at Middle Temple Treasury, there were two, an older lady who was horrid and a young girl who was nice. Um, and she said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. You'll get called, I'll make sure we get somebody. So it started off pretty negatively and it, it yeah, it's not great. So I, and I was very much 
put off by my sponsor, who is a venture and a silk and everything else. He was not that senior at the time, who said that I should, why didn't I consider uh, going back to work in my home country? Because why would anyone white want to brief a barrister who wasn't when they could have a barrister that was? And I said, yes, I, I would love to go home to practice. And his shoulders were up with excitement. He said, well, that's the answer, isn't it? I said, but there isn't a court in St. John's Wood. <laughs> and then he realised I'd been taking the piss the whole time. But it was, I, I think it was pretty tragic. As a 20-year-old, you felt kicked in the head totally to be told, we don't want you. Or not we. I don't think it was him so much that he was being. He was basically saying, give up, love. You're not going to get anywhere here. So go back or go and be a solicitor. Um, because no one at the bar, we don't, you're never going to make it at the bar. So when I was the first woman on the fat cat list in about 2004, ever, I felt like writing to him and saying, well, someone must have instructed me then, dear. But, um, you know, these things happen to all of us, don't they? Can, can I ask you a little bit about that? I mean, when you're going through that, that's obviously very difficult and very isolating, especially if you see others around yeah, you. Yeah, especially in 1981. It, well, I was going to say, was it that you did get some support from some people or was it just your own belief or, or your own character that you're, you're just not going to put up with that sort of behaviour that made you carry on? What, what do you think? Um, a little bit of support. I was really lucky. So in the flat, I lived with my parents and in the, in the ground floor flat was a very nice silk and former head of chambers called David Weitzman, whose son is now, his grandson is Tom Weitzman and they're, they're still Devereux Chambers. Um, and he retired by then, he was a Labour MP, and I used to just go down for a cup of tea with him and we'd talk about the laws of evidence and my essays and very enjoyable, very supportive. And he said, look, you're never going to be clever enough to get a first. And I said, true. And he said, I could get you a pupillage in my chambers, but they never take you on because of your colour. So there's no purpose. So he said, most people make the mistake of starting at the top and working down, going to a good set, which will never take them, and then working down. He said start at the opposite way, start at the bottom and work up and try and get into a set where you'll be accepted uh, from the beginning. And then after five years, you'll work out whether you're good or not and what you want to do and then move anywhere you want. He said, for what it's worth, I think you'll be a great success, but I don't think you should go anywhere conventional because they will just reject you because of your colour and your background in the sense I wasn't super wealthy or anything like that. We were just normal my father was a television producer. My mother worked for BBC too. So we, I mean, we were solvent, but we weren't we weren't moneyed. There's one thing I wanted to pick up on that you you just said. The advice you got. Did you take that advice? Did you? Yes. Did you yes, start? Yes, I went to. I, but yes, I did. I started at the bottom. I worked up. I worked out what I was good at. I built up a practice. And at five years' call, I moved to Dick Ferguson's set, which was then one crown office row. Okay. But I moved chambers a lot after that. I, eight sets of chambers, and it probably would have been nine if I'd stayed at the bar because. I'm not somebody who stays in one place if things are not, I don't mean the way I like them, I'm not spoiled brat, but if I feel that someone is being treated unfairly, and in one case, it wasn't me particularly, it was the younger women in chambers. I reported that chambers to the to um, the equal opportunities officers at the Park Council and got them to do a work monitoring scheme for the junior tenants because there was a lot of favoritism going on with young men. And then I left because obviously they hated me for <laughs> doing that. So, um, yeah, so I'm always in a fight with something. I'm trying to make a difference to something because we are successful, all of us here, all of you, but we cannot just sit there and draw up the bridge behind us or sit in our glass ceiling and say, look at me, look at me. It's just not good enough. Um, uh, just Shams, I'm going to move to you in a second, but there's just one more thing I, I wanted to ask you about the, this early stage. From what you say, it's not always the people that you expect that support you. So it's not no. always women and it's not always women of no. colour. Has that been your experience? Yes, very much so. Um, I think that's why I always say at the bar for every one bad person, and they are, we all know that there are many, there are 10 that are good. And the peak support often comes from the most right wing, the, the white, very upper class men who you think they wouldn't even notice me. And on the contrary, they're, they're, they're right with you all the way. And certainly the people that have helped me, I think the people I identify as helping me most later on are Jeffrey Pegden and Sean Lyons, who were both white men. Well, I'm just going to move uh, on to, yeah, to Judge Thompson and certainly in terms of uh, early career. Um, yeah, well, I started um, 
A bit like Callie said, I, I, I decided um, fairly early on that I was going to try and, um, well, when I say start at the bottom, I, I, it wasn't almost, it wasn't really as strategic as that. It was, um, and this is something I, I think we'll come back to later, but I thought, well, I'm never going to get in anywhere posh. Hmm. So um, not necessarily, I wasn't thinking necessarily from a race point of view because I was quite naive about that sort of thing at that time um it, it was more that I thought from uh, the fact I've got I've gone to a fairly rapey university and also that I was a woman so I thought well you know I'm not really good enough um I'm so let me just sort of you know start where I'm, I'm meant to be so um so my early career yeah I did a law degree uh, and a bit like Callie, I had wanted to be a barrister from the year dot. Um, I was uh, completely obsessed with, I'm sure um, Barbara and Callie will remember this programme. I'm not sure uh, if <laughs> and you will, but uh, there was a programme called Crown Court. No. And, um, I just Inspiration. Loved it. Um, and this was in the days before you could, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't record it on your your set top box or whatever. Um, so I had to, you could, and it was on at lunchtime, you know, after the the news. Um, and it was a little bit risky because it was an ITV, you know, and we didn't really watch it. <laughs> um, but I was brought up in Scotland, and um, so everybody, and in Scotland, the legal system is you become a solicitor first, and then you spend a couple of years being a solicitor before you can then train to be an advocate. So all, uh, and I come from, my parents are doctors, all their friends are doctors, and, uh, you know, everybody expected me to do the um, Asian thing of being a doctor as well, because my parents were doctors. So when I said I wanted to do law and I wanted to be a barrister, they were like, yeah, but you're going to be a solicitor, aren't you? And then once you've been a solicitor, that's it, you're not going to do anything else. I was going to, I'm going to be a barrister in England. Um, and so this was this was quite shocking. So I think my, my initial struggle, if you like, was to convince people that I was serious about coming down south and actually training for the bar. Um, and when I went to university, um, nobody, everybody was going to be a solicitor. All my all my peers wanted to be solicitors. Nobody wanted to be a barrister. Um, so I found one other guy in my year who wanted to come to the bar. So so I kind of felt by the time I got here and was actually at the Inns of Court School of Law, I'd, I felt as if I kind of fought my way to, to that point. And at that stage, I remember my my mum uh, and dad coming down uh, just before I started um, at bar, bar courts. And we were wandering around the temple. I was just kind of showing them around. And my mum said to me, darling, do you really think this is for you? Do you think you're going to be all right? And, and she was walking past, you know, where, where all the, the signs have, you know, judge this and judge that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was, what, 21 um, and quite naive and quite cosseted and, you know, didn't really know very much about the world. And, um, and I was just, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Don't worry about it, Mum. I'll be fine. And, and I think that's probably what, you know, Callie was saying it was her, her sheer bloody mindedness that got it through. I think it was just my complete lack of awareness of anything. <laughs> I just I just kind of sailed on through just going, oh, yeah, oh, you don't want me. Oh, all right. OK. Not thinking uh, really anything about it. Um, so um, so I started off, I, I did my pupillage at um, what's now 187 Fleet Street. And now oh, it's not charter anymore. I can't remember what they are now, but um I did two, two sixes and um, and I didn't get taken on and um, but but we were all we were you know there were a whole load of us um, girls as pupils and um, and it was very much we would go around looking at chambers and looking to see uh, if they'd taken a woman on recently because if they'd taken a woman on recently they, they weren't going to take you on so there was no point in applying yeah. uh, because we were all going to go and have babies obviously um, and by this time, I had met my husband, who's also at the bar, um, and he was a year behind me. So he did, he did his pupils the year after, and he didn't get taken on where he was. And so we got to the stage where we were applying for third sixes at the same time and for tenancies at the same time. And he was getting interviews and I wasn't. And still in my naivety, I was like, oh, that's a bit that's a bit rubbish um not really thinking anything of it you know not not thinking well he's a white male and I'm a um uh, uh an Asian female um so I don't yeah it was it was it was very strange anyway um I then ended up I was in fact doing my first crown court trial at Harrow Crown Court which is where I'm now based and um I had applied to be uh to to, to go to Harrow Chambers in Harrow 
And it just so happened that I happened to be doing a trial there. And I ended up going there with Raj Shetty and uh, somebody else. And we, and I just, just kind of found my niche. And it was, it, it was, it was lovely. I had a, a fantastic time. Um, can, before can, I, just go. I just want to just a little bit more on that because um, what I noticed, and I think this is correct, is um, you had a career break when you had children and it was yeah. Compared to a lot of people, um, it was a it, fairly lengthy. It was a six-year yeah. career break, same yeah. as mine, I'd like to point out. Um, but when you returned, you you went uh, in-house, didn't you? You went to the nursery, yeah. nursing, forgive me, and midwifery council. Yeah. Um, what was your reason for leaving independent practice and going into, into that? Well, when I when I had my first daughter, um, I, was pro- I was about, oh, let me think about um, eight years ago, something like that. Um, and um, and my chambers and Harrow were very supportive, wanted to to try and make it work for me. Um, and um, we tried all sorts of things. I tried working part time. I tried working six weeks on, two weeks off, and you know, all, you know, all sorts of. I tried all sorts of weird and wonderful things. None of which really worked. And by that time, I was pregnant again. Um, and so we took the decision that I was going to stop completely, and then sort of see what happened. Um, and so we, we thought, right, well, stop, have, get all the kids out of the way. So we had three in quick succession. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and then, to be honest, I kind of, again, I suppose the inferiority complex kind of kicked in. And I said, well, I'm not really, I'm, I'm not really good for anything now. And, um, and I just, I honestly thought I'd never come back to the bar. It didn't occur to me that I could make it work in any way, shape or form. And then um, we had some friends over for lunch. I think this was must have been just after our, our son was born. So this is the last one. And um, they were both at the bar. Uh, and um, and she said to me, um, have you thought about coming? She was working at the Nursing Midwifery Council. She said, have you thought about coming to work for us? And I, and I think at that point, I was, I think I was still feeding um, my son and I was still going, what, what, going to work? You know, <laughs> thought my mind was going to work. And about six months later, um, my husband came home branching a copy of Council magazine and saying, look, they're advertising. And I really, really did not want to go back to work. I, we, I remember we had a blazing row about it. I said, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going back. I'm not going How to How old was your, your, your youngest at that point? My youngest was coming up for two, I think. Um, yeah, d- uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe short, maybe 18 months, something like that. Um, and by that time, I then had the whole guilt while I was at home for the older two. Da, 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 da. I don't want him to feel that I'm not giving myself to him. And, you know, all the stuff that we women put ourselves through. Um, and um, and how how is anybody going to do the job as well as I'm doing it? And, you know, all that kind of rubbish. Um, Children we, never remember. No, no. Well, now, you know, <laughs> my kids say to me, Mom, you know, what were you on about, honestly? Um, so... Um, so so that's how it happened and then then of course when I went for the interview um my kind of comp- competitive competitive streak kind of kicked in and I thought I better get in there so I'll be really you know cheesed off um and I got it and that was that was me for for eight years yeah and I worked my way up through that um before I was uh, before I left I left two years before I was appointed and then, yeah. because these discriminations that you for example Judge Mincer um, and Judge Cole have spoken about, they still exist today, but sometimes they're just dressed in very different clothes. And, you know, while we are all actively trying to change the experiences of, of people like us that are coming through the profession, there's still a lot of work to be done. So I think I'm really grateful for the honesty and the frankness of which you've, you've shared the experiences, and I know that people will benefit from them. So going into the meat of the, of the really, the, we want to know about how you got there. So just going about getting to the bench, because uh, I, I won't go through the depressing statistics, but the latest statistics um, published, I think it was about four weeks ago by the Bar Council's Independent Review, um, show that the number of minorities on the bench really is embarrassingly low, and for women in particular, it's, it's not getting any better. And so I think it's really important for people to understand, in spite of a start like the one we've heard of, how, how it is that you all three individually got there. So Judge Mincer, may can I just come to you first, please, and ask you when it was that you first thought about a judicial role? When during your career did you think 
first started thinking about a judicial appointment? Well, I, I didn't think about it independently, much like uh, I, I fell into law accidentally. Um, Judge Call is uh, perhaps a year or two or three more senior than me in call. And mm -hmm. I'm surprised, well, not surprised, but I'm shocked uh, by the appalling attitudes uh, so blatant that she just described. And I suspect that rather like uh, Judge Thompson, that I probably experienced the same, but it wasn't as blatant as it was in, in your face as Judge Call had just described. Um, and so I just thought, well, you know, they didn't take me, so perhaps I wasn't good enough and I didn't have a law degree to start off with and that, that sort of thing. It never occurred to me to apply for a judicial post because I didn't see very many women doing it. Uh, when I was doing crime in my early days and certainly when I was doing civil, I didn't see any civil uh, circuit judges or district judges and the criminal uh, circuit judges I saw and the criminal DJs in the magistrates court were incredibly fierce. They had the sort of character that I don't have. They were aggressive, <laughs> they were sometimes rude, and so I didn't see myself in their image. Uh, and um, as for ethnic minorities, I never once saw a black or ethnic minority judge at all in my practice. And uh, as Judge Call just says, it's surprising what comes to you from an angle that you wouldn't expect. And the reason I got, fell into doing uh, digital work was that somebody in my inn um, who I was sitting next to at dinner and who I'd come across uh, because I was very interested. I used to do European competition law so I was actually in Europe quite a, a lot. I spent about three years in Europe doing competition, European competition work and Paul Heim was a registrar at the European Court of Justice where I'd spent some time and um, uh, with him and also with judges in the European Court of Justice. And one day in the inn, he said to me, uh, it was a, a dinner night, and he said, have you ever thought about becoming a judge? And I thought, what? Just out of the blue, he said it. And I said, no. And he said, why don't you <laughs> apply? And I, and I thought, why would I apply to be a judge? I mean, there's no black people. Uh, there's hardly any women, and they're nasty women who are judges. And so he said, come and sit with him in a tribunal that he was sitting in, a financial regulation tribunal. And I said, I know nothing about financial regulation. And he said, it doesn't matter. They're looking not for financial uh, regulation experts, but for people who have judicial qualities of fairness, open-mindedness, gravitas, etc. So I went and sat with him as a wing member. And I did that for a few months and I thought, this is actually quite interesting. And that's how I got into thinking about applying for other judicial posts, but I would never have thought about it myself. So I'm, I'm very grateful to Paul Heim, who sadly passed away earlier this year. Before coming on to Judge Hall, can I just pick up on something you said, Judge Mintzer, and having appeared before you, I know what you mean about gravitas, but you were very <laughs> lovely to me. <laughs> but, I um, hope I wasn't aggressive <laughs> and bullying as I just described others. The, the gravitas, I mean, everyone who was waiting to go in your call, you know, had that respect because of the gravity, but also, you know, being very, very nice. And you said something that, you know, when someone said, to you, when Paul said to you, would you consider sitting, um, taking an appointment? You said, well, no, there are no women and there are no black people. Mm. That really moves to the key issue of visual representation. Um, how important do you think representation is in terms of making um, practitioners believe that judicial appointment is something that they're capable of doing? I think it's absolutely crucial because, as I say, from my own experience, I didn't see it and so it never occurred to me to apply for it. Uh, and so you need more people there. Otherwise, uh, the system is losing out on talented people who could have applied, but simply don't do so. It also inspires confidence in those who appear before us, not just the advocates to apply, but uh, just as recently as about a month ago, I had two defendants in front of me, black boys, and they came in from whichever prison they were in. One sat down, and as the other one was sitting down, I heard him. He obviously I don't know whether he thought he was on mute or something, but he said to the other boy that was sitting there, God, there's a black woman who's the judge. <laughs> <laughs> so it shows how rare we all are as ethnic minorities. If, if even now, 2020, uh, 2021, somebody has to say, God, there's a black woman who's a judge. Yeah. Um, well, we, say, we say it, Judge. We say it as practitioners. You know, <laughs> a black woman, an Asian woman, we're like, oh, my goodness, you know, because it is such a rarity. So you can imagine what defendants yeah. Thing. Yeah. Can I just ask all, all three of you to, to take this uh, question in turn, if you wouldn't mind? It, it seems from what you've said that 
one thing that does play a role in, in applying for judicial office or even applying for certain things is someone, you know, external, someone else saying to you, have you thought of this? And do you think... Do you think that's more of a female trait of needing sort of external approval and almost being tapped rather than thinking for ourselves? Yeah. Like I'd like to say a lot of white men do. Yeah, I've got this. Do you think we need somebody else to tell us? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I do it all the time. I'm always pulling people into my room or sending them emails saying, you're very good. Come to me. I'll help you. And, you know, just the last few weeks, a lot of my protégés have been appointed. I couldn't be more delighted. Can I just ask, was it the same experience for you that it has to be external? It's got to be somebody who asks, who tells you you're good enough, really? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I remember my very first week of pupillage, seeing a judge in a London, a, a white male judge in a London Crown Court and thinking, looking at him and thinking, God, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. But that would never be me in early years. Um, and I have to say, my, the two the two people who really sort of spurred me on if you like is first I must say was my husband my husband kept on saying to me why don't you apply why don't you apply and um the other was when I went to do judicial shadowing um with uh Anna Guggenheim who's of course now not judge anymore but um she used to sit Amazing. at Iowa, um and I went to sit with her and I think she was probably the first person that made me think actually maybe I could do this uh, and by this time I was at the NMC and, and that was my other, my huge hang up when it came to judicial appointment was I wasn't in, I wasn't in a fancy chambers doing, you know, murders and da, 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 da. I was, I was managing a, a legal department basically. Um, so, but she was great. She was like, well, I think well, there's no reason why you can't do it. There's no reason why you can't do it. And so that was, that was the beginnings of the, the planting of the seed of, well, maybe I should try and do this. Um, I always wanted to do it. I just never thought that it was for the likes of me on on so many levels, not just as, as I've said, not just on race and and gender, but on all sorts of you know I'm not quite good enough. Um, and I think that that's that's my biggest lesson. I think I've taken away from my, the whole thing is don't you know don't just say I'm not going to try to do something because I think I'm not good enough. It's funny you said that. Pat and I earlier on were speaking, and we said that you know if I had a pound for every time someone said to me. Why don't you apply for silk? Why don't you apply to yeah. silk? I mean, yeah. you, you take every box, you know, you're on committee. Yeah, like, you're yeah, on yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's quite insulting. And then when you get there, instead of thinking for a minute that you're good enough to do the work you're doing or do the cases you're doing, they have to find a reason to put you in a box that they can explain away your presence. They can't accept you as you are, so they have to explain that you're there for a different reason. And that's that's pretty insulting too. What piece of advice would you give to your younger selves and why, just in terms of perhaps making the journey a little bit easier and advising people about what they could perhaps do differently in terms of the transition from senior practice through to silk through to the bench? Oh, Barbara. Barbara, Barbara, yeah, Barbara because mine is always you. fighting with somebody. Sorry. I'll, start <laughs> with, I'll start with you, gentlemen. So do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, looking back, hindsight is wonderful. So if I'm looking back, I'd say, well, uh, I didn't get uh, as far as I wanted or as quickly as I wanted because I lacked confidence mm. and I didn't have any um, supportive background. Nobody in my family had been to university. Nobody had um, uh, become a, a lawyer. So my dad and my mum were just at every stage I got to. It was like, this is absolutely fantastic, you know, um, I got a degree that's fantastic if I'd done nothing more they would have been they couldn't have been more pleased um uh, it's not a criticism of them it's just that you know th this is more than anybody else had achieved in the family so if I was looking back I'd say well go for it have the confidence which I didn't have but uh now I think probably uh, Kelly knows more than me I, they have got mentoring schemes and the like so I, I can't um say that I would change now because I, I still wouldn't have that background to enable me to do so but now what I can do is help other people who are coming forward. So I've always got an open invitation, come and do work shadowing, come and sit with me. Um, certainly when I was in Luton, I haven't been very long in, in Wood Green, people would come to court and they would send a note saying, could they come and sit with me? And um, they always did. And sometimes people asked to sit with me who I didn't know. And when I asked them why, they said, well, because you're a woman or because you're an ethnic minority and I hadn't seen any other person like this. And so I'm asking mm. to sit with you. Um, so uh, that's what I'd encourage um, people to do. If there were such people when I was younger, I would have encouraged them to do the same for me. But what I needed was confidence, really, and I, I simply lacked it. And I had this inferiority complex, not so much, um, it was 
that awful word that everybody uses now, intersectionality. So it was partly being female, mm. but actually not mo- mainly. Partly being an ethnic minority, but again, not mainly. But also not having a law degree. Everybody had a law degree. Uh, and I felt so inferior because of it. I actually went off and did a master's a few years later uh, before I, I, I took a, a, t- a tenancy somewhere. So it was a combination of things that uh, prevented me getting on as much as I could. And probably also a, a failure to recognise racism. I mean, Kelly's mm. mentioned things that I suspect happened to me as well, but it just didn't occur to me that people were actually being racist when they didn't take me on for a, a tenancy, for example. <laughs> Naivety. Do you think things are changing more more generally? Well, I think everybody has a different experience, don't they? Um, and I, I've always felt... Um, that my gender was more of an issue than my race. That's always, that's just been my experience. Um, and I'm very fortunate. I'm at a court where we have a lot of women. And um, leaving aside the fact that we're all menopausal and that kind of has its moments, um, we, um, it, it, it means that we can support each other in a different way. And I think that the, the temperature of the court, you know, behind the scenes and in court is different. Um, and I went to do, um, I went to another court centre for a couple of weeks, this was pre-pandemic, to cover a case for a, another court, um, where there was only one other woman there, and and she sort of pounced on me when I got there and went, thank God! <laughs> um, and I was desperate to get back to Harrow, and when I went back, I, I said, because, you know, I've never, although as a recorder I sat in the Midlands, you know, as a full-timer, this is my, my first court, and um, and I've never experienced any other court. And so I've been rather spoiled, you know, because I've got a really supportive resident. I've got, you know, good female colleagues. We're all experiencing similar things. We're all, you know, we're all a similar sort of stage in life. Um, so it was great. And I actually said to one of my male colleagues, I said, oh, I'm so glad to be back. You know, I, I found it quite strange being in this other, uh, this other court. And he said, well, I actually quite like having lots of women around because it, it creates a different atmosphere for the men as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, my own view is that the way that we change things is by getting more of us being mm-hmm. the person Absolutely. that you, you, you know, that you walk into court and you see a non-white woman or uh, uh, on the bench and you think, actually, if she can do it, there's no reason why I can't do it. And I think my, again, this is my own personal view, is the biggest problem we have is that women, like both of you, women who are experienced and competent and excellent at their jobs, there are too many women and women of colour who think it's not for me. Yeah. And so that's why, that, that's the biggest, that's, that's the first stumbling block, because if you don't apply, then you're yeah. never going to get there. So, and it goes back to that whole thing of thinking we're not good enough. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask Judge Mensa really, do you, and uh, to each of you in turn really, do you think we bring something different? If, if, if women are in these roles, are we bringing something different or is it the same old, same old, but just in a different package? I don't know. I'd be interested to see what the others think. I was the only female in my court for about 10 years. There was no other woman there. Uh, so I did feel that I brought something different. Uh, because I, I, I was a woman, I felt I was more empathetic. I was more sympathetic, I thought, to counsel if they asked for time off for childcare or difficulties or go and see their baby, their, their, their child's nativity play. I, I would grant it, whereas my male colleagues wouldn't. But I don't know whether that was just me as an individual or women generally. I haven't. I've, only since I got to Wood Green have I now come in a court where there is more than uh, myself. Another female joined me at um, Luton and I did feel that the the atmosphere changed a lot when she came. She was a a lot more robust uh, than I am and things that I just simply put up with and not said anything about, um, partly because they washed over my head and partly because I just didn't want any sort of confrontation. This is a course I'm stuck in with five males. I don't want to be uh, bullied or ostracised because of it. Um, she wasn't willing to put up with it. We also had... Um, uh, did, did you learn uh, from that? Did, did that? Was that a valuable um, lesson for you, Judge? Because, you it know, was, you said... But it's, it's not my temperament. I just felt that I could change things in the way in which I wanted to change yeah. things without yeah. being confrontational. But I could see that, actually, it was helpful to others. We had a, another female circuit judge who sat with us from time to time. Um, she wasn't full-time. 
And she had a temperament a bit like me and put up with a lot of things, but she was incredibly robust and I really did admire her. Sadly, she passed away a few years ago. Um, I, I don't, if you, any of you do family, you'll know Laura Harris. Um, sorry, Joe Harris, not Laura Harris. Oh, Laura, Laura's alive and well. Laura's alive, sorry. <laughs> Joe Harris, who passed away. And I remember on one occasion, it was uh, I was just there and then um, Joe came to sit with us in the summer as she did from time to time. She was a family circuit judge. And um, there had been recent appointments of quite a lot of women um, to the circuit bench. And um, it, it was an, over lunch, we were discussing it. And one of the circuit judges, a full-time male circuit judge, said, oh, well, um, they got it because they ticked the right boxes. Here's a female with children and there's another one. And, and so he went on. And Joe Harris just laid into him. And she said, this is absolutely appalling. It's sexist. It's and I was incredibly impressed. Was, in fact, the other men were also impressed. And after that, we never got that culture again. And I've often wondered, well, perhaps if I took a stand to start off with, um, we wouldn't, I wouldn't have put up with 10 years of that. I mean, I, I'd love them dearly, the, the men that were with me. But um, there was that sort of culture. But I came into it. I didn't know a single judge when I got there. I was the only female judge. So um, I, I was shocked to be appointed as a circuit judge. And the last thing I was going to do was start um, standing up to them. Uh, but I was impressed when Joe did it many, many years later. So it, it gave me courage to think, well, actually, I don't have to put up with sexist comments and stupid jokes either. <laughs> you know? yeah, I, I, I do hope that the fact that, I, you know, I've had quite a, um, a gentle introduction, I suppose, to full time judicial life because of that. But I, I, what I think it will help me with is if it, when the time comes when I'm somewhere else or that, you know, the makeup of the judges changes at the court that I'm at. I think having had that experience of that culture, I think I'd be less likely to put up with um, the, the, that sort of um, sexist and uh, yeah. behaviour. But, you know, it, it's interesting. And I was very lucky because when I started, I had another judge who started, another female judge who was a solicitor who started at the very same time as, as me. So we we were new girls together. And that that really helped, you know, because she could challenge all the all the kind of very barristerial um, put downs that used to come um, come our way. I, you know, and and it, it it just has created a very different culture, I think, which mm. I hope we'll be able to take with us, because I think, again, that's the only way it's going to change. But again, as the as the numbers begin to change um, and, and you do get more courts with more women then it's going to have to, isn't it? And it's not just numbers, it's attitudes. Yeah. Because if we simply appoint clones of the existing men, and there are women who are clones yeah. of the existing men, mm -hmm. that won't change it. So it's not enough to be a woman or to be a woman of colour. It is also to have a different attitude yeah. and be much more open. And I think we do bring a lot because, first of all, the barristers may not appreciate it, but the defendants do because they can see someone who understands yeah. their background, their culture, the difficulties they might have had, whether it's in Sierra Leone or in the DRC or in Asia or anywhere else. Domestic violence, cases like that. I think we do we do bring our own backgrounds and we're not all from very posh backgrounds. So we bring the experience of our, all our families with us. And I think that that's equal equally with white judges. I'm not saying it's just a brown mm. judge thing. But those really are important things because we see things through their eyes. Not that we've had to suffer necessarily in the way they've had to no. suffer, but we do see it un unjudgmentally. Yeah. And I, mean, I think that's really important. And that brings, it brings us really to the final couple of questions. So that it's really the future. And you know, we've kind of touched on it a bit. So, I mean, should we, we'll have a question each on, on the future. And I, I, I'd like to ask, I don't think it's on the list, but just in terms of practically, um, what people now considering judicial appointment, whether it be to sit as a recorder part time or circuit judge appointments or you know you know tribunal appointments, practically bearing in mind the obstacles that we know are still very much in place, what would you advise? One one piece of advice to practitioners, female practitioners of colour, considering the next steps in terms of taking judicial appointment. Get allies. I would get say support. go for it. And um, yeah. If, so we start. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with you, and then we'll, we'll move around. I, I, I would say go for it. And what I also tell people, um, a, a bit like Kelly's uh, the advice Kelly was given about starting at the bot bottom, I say to people, um, apply for anything that's going. 
and don't rule out doing tribunal work. Mm. I started off on the financial regulation tribunal. I knew nothing about financial regulation. So it's good experience um, to do lots of tribunals. I did Criminal Injuries Compensation Board um, at, at that time, many years ago. And I, I also applied to be a wing member on some of these tribunals. So I'd say, go for it. Mm. Don't feel that you've got to go for the circuit judge first. Go for tribunals or anything else, partly because it will give you experience of sitting to see whether you do actually like being a judge, because it, it, it may find that you don't like being a judge. And also partly because it will give you interview practice. I don't know what the interviews are like now, but uh, certainly when I did it with a, a panel of three, you wanted to get interview practice to think about the sort of questions you're going to ask, the sort of answers you're going to give. So um, I'd say apply for as many things as you can. You can always reject them, but if you don't apply for them, you're not going to get them. So you've got to be in it to win it. Go for it is, is my advice. Apply for anything. And uh, I have an open invitation. Come and do some marshalling or uh, work experience or judicial shadowing. Yeah, everyone has anytime. Wimbley now. It's the best place because Barbara and I are there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Judge Cole, moving to you. Practical um, advice. I think I say the same. I'm not going to repeat what Barbara said, but the same thing. And expect rejection. Don't think because you're rejected once, twice, three. I can't give you the names. It's unfair. But I know a president judge that was rejected 11 times. He's oh. retired now. Yeah. Another judge, very well thought of, eight times. You know, you've just, I'm not saying you should be rejected, but you could be. Apply, apply, apply. Get as much help and support. Get really supportive people around you. Also recognise your own faults. I mean, you know, some people go in with such an arrogant attitude. None of us are brilliant. Nobody's perfect. But do your best. Some people are so arrogant. They walk in some seemingly thinking, well, you know, I should get. And sense of entitlement is not going to get you anywhere. Just do it. Really work hard and really do your best at the job you're doing. And bit by bit, more and more people will help you, will recognise your ability. So practically speaking, yes, apply for lots of other things. Um, uh, before I was appointed, I used to sit as a legal assessor for professional disciplinary um, panels, that sort of thing. Um, and the biggest thing is that that will get you in the way of competency based application forms and um, interviews. You've got to get your head around competency based applications it's no good for the bar to be thinking oh we're you know we're above competency based things you know no that's that's the way of the world you've got to do it um so you need to familiarize yourself with the competency the the competencies that are um that all judicial appointments are made against and i would say start jotting down little this is what i did little notes if you, if you something happens in a case and you do something just think, oh, well, that's actually that you could weave that into uh, an exercising judgment um, competency or a working with others competency, whatever it is. If you're serious about it, I'm afraid it is a lot of work mm -hmm. and you've got to be single minded in it. You can't just turn up and decide that you want to be a recorder or a deputy D a DJ or whatever it is. So be serious about it. Understand how competency based applications work. Um, apply for anything that's going. Um, go and do things where you're able to chair things because that I mean effectively that's what you have to do in court and the more when I was applying because I worked in-house and I was on various boards and I used to chair meetings and do all that sort of thing all the time chair disciplinary hearings that kind of thing that was the sort of thing I was able to bring up so go and, and go on to committees you know whether it's the, the bar council uh, or the, the bar standards board or whatever it is um, or the solicitors regulatory authority whatever go and do all that um, go and become school governor I mean school governor governing bodies are littered with um, wannabe judges uh, go and do that I did that as well um, you know it, it's about being absolutely single-minded about it if you really want it it's not enough to go along and say I really really want it you've got to put the, 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 the work in. The other thing is go and sit. Um, I think we're, we're all, we've all said, I love having people coming to sit with me. I really enjoy it. Um, so please come sit with us, um, talk to us. Um, if you are offered help, take it. I can't tell you the number of people who I will sit, who say to me, they're applying for judicial posts. And I say, well, you know, I, I'm very happy to give you some advice and just some, give you some pointers, give me a call, never hear from them again. You know, and it may well be that they've got somebody far more, far better to, to advise them, which is great. But, um, you know, take help if you're being offered it and don't be too proud to take it. Um, can I, can I, but, than it would for somebody but what I'm saying, I suppose what I'm saying, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier, is don't be put off 
you know, don't don't fail before you've even started. Mm. Um, and but the other thing I will say is be really, really honest with yourself mm. because um, I'm. I, I say this now. I think I'm a much better judge than I was a barrister. So you know, not there are lots of other barristers who are much better at being a barrister than I was. Yeah but they might not necessarily be a good judge. So you've got to be honest with yourself. What is it you are good at in your job? And does that translate into being on the bench? And if you think it does and you want to do it, then do it, but put in the work. If you're not prepared to do the work for the application, then don't bother because it is hard work. You just have to be bloody minded, single minded and just think. I always tell people because I mentor a lot of people, just treat it like a driving test. Because you fail the driving test, it doesn't mean you're a worse driver than the woman who passed it before yeah. you. But but also be really, that day. Yeah, you've got also got to think. I mean, I I I didn't get CJ the first time I, I applied for it, and I then had to really ruthless to myself go well, okay, what what was it that I did? And I knew I knew as soon as I came out of the interview that I completely screwed it up. Um, but I actually thought to myself, right, what what did I do well? Because I got through to the final round. So I must have done something right to get there. But what was it that I didn't do right? And uh, and I really, you know, sat there and forensically tried to be really objective about it. And I got the feedback from the JAC. I didn't agree with some of it. And then I was like, oh, that's outrageous. That's not true. Da, 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 da. But then actually I sat down and, you know, really thought about it. Um, so you've got, you know, you've got to do a lot of soul searching, a lot of honesty with yourself. Um, but yes, get your, pick yourself up. When I was rejected, and, you know, anybody who's gone through this process knows it takes forever. And I think I got my rejection through in the November and they launched another competition like the next February or March. And I'm still licking my wounds. And I thought, oh, do I go again? Do I go again? And my husband, all the judges I knew when I was sitting as a recorder said to me, of course you do. Off mm. you go. And yeah, you do. You get yourself, you pick yourself back up and you get through it. And I got it. So, you know, that's that's the way to do it. Thank you so much. So thank you, guys. And Farrat's going to, I think, Farrat, the last question for the judges. I have. Um, we may have covered some of this, but in case there's anything more to be said, um, what more can be done or should be done by those, by the powers that be, or any of us really, but what more can be done to increase diversity at the judiciary specifically? So we start with your judgment, sir. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what they're doing at the moment, uh, actually. I'm, I'm so far removed from um, the recruitment process. But I, I think, um, just looking at my own experience and from people I, I talk to, that mentoring schemes are very important. Um, work shadowing is very important. People Putting people in touch, giving people the confidence to apply. Um, and uh, I know that uh, some people have done um, work shadowing schemes and sometimes haven't um, felt that they've got very much out of it. I know from um, my, my previous court that we, we had um, a couple of people come who were uh, assigned to judges, not to myself, who felt very unhappy. Uh, one of them I, I took on myself because I, I felt embarrassed about the way he was being treated by one of the other judges, comments about him behind his back, but uh, you know, it translated into an attitude towards him. Um, so I, I think that... Um, they ought to try and marry up more, but I can see the difficulty. I, I don't know what the um, the recruitment people are, are doing, the JAC or whoever. I can see the difficulty. There simply aren't enough of us ethnic minorities of, to be married up with. But I'm happy to take any number of people um, who wish to do some work shadowing. But I think mentoring, giving people confidence, putting them in contact, in particular with ethnic minority judges. I don't suppose that that's done. I mean. I, I can't think that I've had more than. No, it is, I mean, they're, 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 they are that. because there are so many schemes. So the JAC have got schemes, for example, Anna Rafferty and Anuja people are specially mentoring. I think it's Circuit Judge Up mm. who, who have applied and repeatedly been rejected with a special emphasis on ethnic minorities. So I think they're well, people who want doing. to be circuit judges or yes, people but who have been, reje but right. have been rejected. So mm -hmm. there, there are, and there are PAD schemes, there are access right. schemes. I think there are a lot of schemes and I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be. There should be more and they should be genuine schemes. But I do think we've got to get to the nitty gritty of this. It's all very well saying scheme, 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 but it hasn't worked, has it? So, so I what think else can be to, done? Well, I think we take apart the applications of all of those who are rejected. We 
videotape them so that the panel is interviewing them a video that then goes to another panel who blind mark it again and we go and we take apart every single application and we look at where people are failing exactly where is it the references is it stat con is it non stat con and then work out what is going wrong and then repair that and target those areas because and <laughs> what more can can be done or should be done to increase diversity do you think I think we've we, we've sort of touched on quite a lot of it. I think um, is we can't appoint unless people apply. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's that's the first thing. And I'm afraid I do know a, a number of people who I've had to sort of say, no, there's no reason why you shouldn't apply. Um, we we sort of say, seem to self select, and um, we can't, you know, you can't do that. Um, so that's the biggest thing I think you, that needs to be done is that. Um, not just um, women, not just ethnic minorities, but people from a different background. Absolutely right. You know, um, I, I mentioned my colleague who's a solicitor mm-hmm. and, and she said, you know, she was, we were talking, I was mentioning to her today that I was coming to, to do this, um, this talk. And, um, and she said, you know, she's had um, work experience people coming in and say, and when she says she was a solicitor and they say, I didn't know solicitors could become judges. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, we're a Wickle group. We're, we've got solicitors, we've got barristers, you know, I've got solicitors in my mentoring group. You know, there's no reason why it, it has to be somebody who's been in chambers and, you know, for 20 years, really? um, whatever background. And um, I recently did a, a, a thing at my inn for the employed bar. And one of the things I was talking about there was, just because you're at the employed bar doesn't mean you can't be a judge. In fact, you, you you get a lot more experience of the sorts of things you need to be a good judge. So um, so that's really what we need to do is start, you know, opening people's minds, not just the JAC, not just the powers that be, but those of us who are applying. Um, that yeah, there's no reason if you've got the skills, it doesn't matter what your background is. You know, mm-hmm. if you've got the skills, then apply. Don't don't deprive us of a good judge just because you don't think you're good enough because we might think you are. On that note, <laughs> thank you so much. I can't tell you how much I have enjoyed listening to all three of you. Um, as I say, all very different experiences, but all very, very similar. And I, I have no doubt that when people watch this, they will be, you know, they will leave feeling inspired. And that's really what the objective is. We're not turning a blind eye to the issues. We know that we operate within a system that is inherently racist, that is inherently sexist, and we are alive to that. But we all work day in, day out, as uh, Judge Call said, she cannot leave us alone. <laughs> Please don't leave us. Judge oh, no, no, listen. Oh, I mean, we, I mean we, some we, people say, yeah. but by rocking the boat, I'm actually bringing, making things worse. Well, there we are. Sometimes yeah. you've just got to rock a boat and be a disruptor and see if that can bring about positive change. It can't for me. No, um, no. It's too late, but it can for other people. And I feel we have a moral obligation to help those that come after. Otherwise, we may as well not exist. And none of, you know, none of us walked through a closed door. The door was always slightly ajar. And that was because of people like you guys that have come. And before. the people that came before us as well. And Absolutely. And people come after. So we are so grateful to you. This will be the first of many um, and what a start it was. So thank you guys. And we really, really appreciate you giving up this evening. And we, I know Farah and I certainly um, have learned a lot this evening. <laughs>